Hi, my name is Ben Hutton and you're joining us for Jason Schema in Production, where we look at Jason Schema in the real world. Today we have Mads Christensen with us from Microsoft, who's a project manager for the Microsoft Visual Studio team. Well, thank you for joining us today, Mads Christensen, and thank you for making time. Um, My pleasure. It's great to have you uh, on Jason Schema in Production today. Um, so to start with, why don't you tell us uh, a little bit about yourself and uh, who you are and where you work and uh, what you get up to. Sure. Um, I've been a web developer um, since the late 90s and worked at a bunch of startups back in uh, back in Copenhagen, Denmark. And, um, you know, at some point I, I did a lot of open source uh, work uh, on various different things. Um, and at some point, Microsoft reached out to ask if I want to work on the web tooling in Visual Studio. And this is about, I think, 2010. And I was like, yeah, that sounds fantastic. Uh, mm. I was using Visual Studio at the time, so it was a fantastic opportunity to then work on the tools my, that I used myself as a web developer. So mm -hmm. I, I jumped on that, moved to Seattle, and um, and I've yeah basically done that um, ever since being on the Visual Studio team. But it was while I was, I was working on the web tooling, like HTML and CSS and all this sort of stuff, that um, it was uh, time for us to build a JSON editor. And at the time, there wasn't really any JSON editors out there in the wild. Mm -hmm. so we were kind of, we were kind of the first. Usually, we saw other uh, editors and IDs. They would have like syntax highlighting, and they might have code folding or outlining. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that was kind of it. And then maybe, maybe basic auto completion based on what you know the tokens in the document. And, mm -hmm. and that was mm -hmm. that was the what it you know the extent of that. So, but we wanted to, to do a full implementation. So that was, that was how the journey into JSON and JSON schema and all that sort of stuff started um, okay. back in 2013, I think. Okay. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. So where do you sit now within uh, Microsoft and um, what is your sort of uh, role and what do you, what do you do now? Well, I'm still in the Visual Studio team, so I've been moving around a little bit internally, but um, I've been on the Visual Studio extensibility team for quite a while because I built a lot of extensions for Visual Studio. Mm -hmm. A lot of them was web related back when I was, uh, you know, on the web part of, of Visual Studio and now they they could be anything. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, so I, I built a lot of extensions, so it was natural for me to move there. And um, and now I'm kind of in the, in sort of a customer facing outreach role a little bit where I do a bunch of YouTube videos. I do a lot of internal sort of UX, uh, reviewing and, uh, helping out internally to, to help create better features, uh, all across the board from Visual Studio and help get people to talk to each other and have, you know, identify synergies between different mm. teams and so on. And so uh, it's a quite a different world now than it, it was uh, when I started, but but it's still on the Visual Studio team. It's still the product that I love and uh, I'm very, very happy to do what I'm doing. Yeah, it's really good when you're passionate about something and you feel you've got really good experience in that area. And, and yeah, as you say, you've already been using Visual Studio for almost a, a decade, I think you said. Um, yeah, when you can come in and have real impact and just improve the, the product that you really uh, enjoy working with uh, yourself yeah. already. Um, I've been using Visual Studio for 20 years and Visual Studio wow. turns 20, I think here in January or February. So Wow, that's yeah. that's huge. 20, mm -hmm. 20 years. I, I remember using it uh, not quite 20 years ago, but some time ago, uh, back when I first started programming. So mm. it's always been a great help to me as well. It's a great home, you know, it's with your IDE, whatever it might be, you, you know, that's where you live for, you know, half of your waking life almost, right? Eight to 10 hours mm. a day, you live in your code editor and, uh, and so it becomes a home and it's a, it's a kind of a special world, a special product. It's different than I feel like most other apps because you don't, you don't live in it. You don't call it home the way you do with mm. your code editor. Yeah, that's right. That's definitely true. You know, you need it to do everything in your workflow, right? You, you want to stay in it as much as possible. You don't want to come out. Yeah. So when you came into Microsoft to work on um, the tooling, what was it that sort of led you to um, JSON schema integration? What was the, what was, the, I guess, the, the challenge that you were presented with? What were people facing that led you down that path? So 
back then I was on the Visual Studio and the .NET team. They were kind of the same. The, the web the web team was part of the .NET team under Visual Studio. And um, we were going to do what's called today .NET Core, which is sort of the, the new wave of, of the .NET <clears throat> infrastructure, right? And um, it didn't have that name at the time. And it was kind of an internal thing. Could we actually make it work even? Um, and it was sort of in that early stage where we were exploring ideas where we found out that we were going to have a JSON file, project, project.json, that was going to be sort of the, uh, the project file where you would like list different settings and whatnot. Kind of similar maybe to a package JSON file from mm. the node world okay. in some, some aspects. Um, and we had to build tooling for it. And that was my team. We were going to build tooling for project JSON. And so we, because we wanted, you know, Visual Studio is known for having like rich IntelliSense or auto completion yeah. um, and all sorts of, of tooling that you're kind of just used to from using different languages in Visual Studio. And so we needed that level of, of let's say, tooling support. Mm -hmm. And we could have gone ahead and done that for just for project.json. So, but we decided not to. So first of all, we had to build a JSON editor. We didn't have one. Mm -hmm. So we started building one, um, but we did it in a way that um, would allow us to plug in sort of an in, like an auto completion and validation infrastructure, no matter how we could do it. Uh, we didn't know how to do it at the time. So, so we did it in a way that we could plug it in later. Mm -hmm. And so as we started looking for how do we, how do we provide great tooling on top of like a basic JSON editor, we looked at what was out there. And the only thing that was there was something that um, no one really had heard about, which was called JSON schema. And JSON schema at the time was in draft four, draft V4. Mm -hmm. And it was, um, was kind of hard to get my head around. I remember looking at it first and it was kind of hard with the, all these uh, one-offs and any-offs. And then, you know, in order to do like exclusive things, you had to do weird kind of logical things like saying not any of or no, you know yeah it was, yeah. had this weird logic to it um but it was like okay there that there seemed to be something here and and we don't have anything better so let's let's see if we can if this is a good fit and we we research it and investigate it and it turned out to be a really good fit and so we built as i think the first editor in the world <laughs> a json schema support into visual studio so this was wow. visual studio 2013 uh like update one or update two or something like that wow, that brought the yeah. JSON schema support in. And, and so at the time there was not, there was no other editor out there that, that had that. Mm. Um, and so that was the way in. And of course we then had to write the schema for project.json, right? Okay. So what, how do we do that? Uh, do we just ship that in the box with Visual Studio? Well, we don't want to do that because what if we need to uh, have a different, different versions of the .NET core runtime you can have one app that you build in Visual Studio using one version of that uh, uh, .NET Core mm. and another app that uses a different version. And they might have differences in the, in the schema of Project JSON, right? So how do, we, how do we store that in a way that's sort of out of box that we can update independently of Visual Studio that doesn't follow Visual Studio per se, but follows more sort of the update patterns of .NET Core? Yeah. And so, and I started thinking about this because that's true for not just .NET Core. It's true for pretty much any other format. They don't they don't update with the Visual Studio cadence, which that would be weird. Mm, yeah, <laughs> uh, so it you know it goes without saying that that's how the world works. And so uh, we needed to come up with like a, a third party kind of repo where people could submit um, their schemas and you know would be completely independent of Visual Studio. And so. In my spare time, I started creating this thing called JSON Schema Store or schemastore.org. Mm -hmm. And we started putting up schemas. And I wrote the first, I don't know, 70 or so schemas myself of all different kinds of things, all the different files I knew, like package JSON, uh, web manifests, mm -hmm. uh, all, all types <coughs> of JSON files that I knew about that I was using myself. And um, and all of a sudden, you know, the people out there, they, they saw that their files that they've been editing for years in plain text in Visual Studio JSON files, all of a sudden they got IntelliSense, they got validation. They was told, hey, you, you made a mistake here, right? Or they got their completion and their IntelliSense, which was uh, a fantastic story. All of a sudden people got that surprise and, uh, 
and we got a lot of, of positive feedback from that. But so I think so I think there's there's two parts to the journey. One is the support for JSON schema in Visual Studio and the sort of the open source independent schema store.org, um, mm -hmm. which is basically, so I put it in its own organization on GitHub. It's not in my name. And that was on purpose from the very beginning. I did not want it to be, I wanted it to be something that could live beyond like a single person's main, mm -hmm. uh, maintaining it and so on. And it does. So with those two things, we now had something I feel like uh, was super powerful. And of course, in the beginning, the amount of people that would send pull requests to add their schema was, you know, kind of slow. It was all new. No one knew, knew about it. But then all of a sudden you saw, uh, you know, the JetBrains IDEs, IntelliJ, you know, WebStorm, all those mm. integrating with um, Schema Store and Visual Studio Code and Android Studio and on and on. All of a sudden, all these major IDEs and editors and extensions like the YAML extension for VS Code, mm. for instance, also gets its power from Schema Store. Yeah. So now all of a sudden it became pervasive. So now everyone interfaced with Schema Store. Everyone knew how to get their, you know, if they have a product or let's say that you got a Node.js module that has like a config file that's in JSON, you can just put a schema up on Schema Store and, and all of your users, no matter what IDE they're using, will get that tooling. So it actually became like this very beautiful story of something that is completely uh, democratizing providing that tooling, right? It's, it's very, very empowering for people to just put a schema up there, maintain it yourself. You don't even have to put the schema up on schema store. You can host it yourself and just add, you know, the URL to the, um, mm. to the sort of the catalog of, of uh, schema store. Um, so it's not like it wants to like own schema store. It does not claim or want to own your schemas. It's just like, Hey, let's create one place that we collect the links, if you will, to all the schemas so that we all can have the best possible uh, user experience. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's it's so powerful once you bring the IDE and that single place to you know, store or find schemas. It's, it's so powerful to have that IntelliSense, have that autocomplete. Um, and not only that, but to, to know what the, the options are and, and what they mean, the semantics as well. Uh, I, I have a, a feed in, a, in the JSON schema Slack where we, uh, pipe in uh, tweets that contain JSON schema, and mm -hmm. it's it's generally you know every week the people are still surprised going oh my my IDE is is auto completing my config files it's it's amazing it's validating them I know I have a config wrong um, and you know it's is a number of stories over the last couple of years where we've seen big outages due to misconfiguration files um, you know they've been in, in YAML or something else. Um, I can't help but wonder how many of those problems wouldn't have been averted if the, the configuration files had been um, validated dynamically um, in the editor. I just, I, I really do have to wonder. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, we've all like made the typos and stuff like that. And, you know, two hours later, we've, we realized that it was just a typo after trying to debug and... <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know. So... so do, that's do exactly, any... but that's exactly the feedback we've heard too. Like um, the people just love that light up and that help that that it gets mm. them. Yeah. So how did you find trying to sell the idea of Jason Schema amongst your your colleagues and and other people that had had stakes in that um, sort of part of the the products? Well, it wasn't really that hard because no one no one knew of anything else. No one and no one knew Jason Schema anyway. So. But everyone understands the concept of, or understood the concept of, let's not invent it. If something already exists out there, we can kind of just use, and there, there's momentum behind or stuff like that. Because we don't want to, if we were to create our own, you know, we would have like a, now it would be like this competing thing. And would it even be better? And just imagine the amount of work it would take to create something like a schema language or a schema mm. format. So, uh, so I think like there was no pushback at all. I think there were questions like, is this really the best or whatever? And um, the, the engineer that, that, that built it all, um, uh, Mike Lorbetsky, he, uh, he, he vetted it basically from a technical perspective and said, this is, this is sound, this solves all the problems we have. It solved the project JSON mm -hmm. uh, problem, like the .NET core thing. 
um, but it also solves it in a generic and general way that works for all schemas. And still to this day, like you can express very, very complicated things in draft four. Yeah. So I think, I think even though the syntax is a little hard to understand if you have never done it before, like a draft four is super powerful. And so, um, so I think Mike was right back then. And I think time has, has proved him right. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's, there's a lot of power and just the, the defining the structure your your JSON and, and mm -hmm. the intelligence behind that uh, is really powerful. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's, there's a lot of things we've added since draft four that people have, have asked for. Um, but still people use even the most basic stuff. I mean, that, that hasn't really changed over the years. Um, it's been a few, few slight changes, but the basics are still there. Um, yeah. and a lot of people just use the basics and that's absolutely fine. Like we, we accept all schema versions on schemastore.org, mm -hmm. uh, but recommend people use draft four because there could be editors or consumers out there that does not, they're not on the latest parser or whatever that understands, like say the, the latest and greatest. And so if you can express it, most schemas are actually very simple. Like they're very, very basic. So if they are, just write them in draft four. Um, then they kind of work everywhere. And I look at like people use the latest, like they use the 2020 uh, draft or whatever. And I guess it's not a draft anymore, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm just used to say draft. With uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but, um, but they're just, but they're not doing anything that couldn't be like, they're basically writing draft four, but they claim that this is a, a, a 2020 schema. And so I'm like, okay, like there's nothing wrong with it. It'll it'll probably work, but let's see if we can then move it to draft four instead. Like if you don't use any of the new language features or whatever language features that uh, format features, mm. then then don't claim it's a it's that you know go to the lowest common denominator basically. Yeah, one of the things we've been thinking about in in JSON schema and also in Postman is um, creating tooling which enables you to do translation between versions of JSON schema where the the versions and the schemas are compatible because um, as you say a lot of stuff that can be expressed in the newer versions can be expressed in the older versions as well yeah um, i think the, the, the what i see people use most that are not like draft four is actually the dollar comment <laughs> which to me is <clears throat> is always kind of it's always kind of funny that, that you do that um i don't know what well, you know in a schema it's kind of interesting people do it like um instead of just using the description, like it's a comment, it's common for the author of the schema, not for the consumer of the schema mm. or, or what, or is it? And so, yeah. right. Well, and that's so exactly so, yeah. Yeah. But then that seems like, is that really, I don't know, maybe it is needed. Maybe, I don't know. It just seems like very, um, not always kind of the, the, uh, worth the jump to like a, a higher version for just adding like a comment about like what something is when there is already a description field that, um, yeah, but, I think you know. I think people wanted to be able to distinguish between stuff that they wanted to appear, appear in their automatically generated documentation, for example, yeah. versus stuff that they want to keep right. just for the people that are editing the schemas. <coughs> right, and that and that's kind of that's always to me it's always been kind of I just th thought that was funny. I, I'm sure it has like some totally valid use cases, uh, but I don't want to talk about. JSON C, like having comments in JSON files, that I feel like that's a completely different rabbit hole. Oh yeah, um, yeah, we could uh, go on for some time about that. And that you know it works fine for like configuration files, but you know it falls flat when you want to you know send JSON over the wire. But um, yeah. So tell me more about um, your your work. You were saying earlier in in um, Swagger two point which is an um, oh, yeah. open API and. Yep. Jason schema and, and what you, you did around that specification. That was, that was kind of fun because, um, yeah, so so at the, when, when was this? This was 2014, I think. So Swagger was um, this API documentation J description mm -hmm. uh, in a, expressed in JSON. It was called Swagger. It's now what's called Open API. I think most people know it as Open API, but back at, the, at that time, it was called Swagger. And the uh, the ASP.NET, the web team, the the on the .NET team, they wanted to have a way that when you wrote a web API using uh, ASP.NET, that there was a description of the API so that you could have like 
other tools automatically generate proxy clients and whatnot to, to talk to this, your service, right? Uh, this is this is kind of you know one of the powerful things, maybe the only good thing about <laughs> back in the day of of uh, Whistle files, back when we did mm. SOAP, mm. but uh, but a WSDL file that described your endpoint <coughs> and what the types were and what to expect, what to go back and forth, so that cl clients like other IDEs or whatever could you could point at that endpoint and say, hey, generate me proxy classes. Mm. And so what's really cool about Swagger Open API is that it allows for that. And so it's like, hey, in this new world of like REST APIs where we, we no longer want SOAP, right? We definitely don't want that. But there's still that need to of the user experience to make it easier to consume a JSON API, a REST API. And so in order to do that in a super good way, you have to be able to describe the endpoint in a way that machines can understand and get the full picture of. And so that, that was what, what, where they were. So, okay, how can we make it working with the REST APIs easier? And so they were interested in getting something like Swagger. And I think there, was other, there were other formats out there. So something called Blue, Blue something. Oh, I, I forget. This, it's some years ago now, seven, eight years ago. Um, but there were different formats. And I think they, they decided on Swagger uh, was the right thing to do. And, mm -hmm. and at that time, so they were in, in contact with, I think Tony Tam was the guy from, from Reverb uh, that ran the Swagger specification. And uh, that was Brady Gaster from the ASP.NET team. And he eventually brought me on board and said, hey, can you help out with the Swagger JSON uh, format? Mm -hmm. and, and Or just take a look to see if it doesn't make sense. And I looked at it and I'm like, hang on, wait a second. You're describing JSON using JSON, using like your own custom invented um, format. That seems like you're like you're reinventing the wheel here. And so I got involved in the working groups and all that sort of stuff, basically taking what they had and migrating all that to JSON schema. Mm -hmm. So we made a hyper schema specifically for, for that uh, purpose of describing an API endpoint. And um, so that was the, the, the Swagger 2.0 came out with being JSON schema based uh, of the work that I did, all the, the pull requests and, and basically that description. And it turned out to be a really cool way of describing and to working on a specification to use JSON schema because it's very precise. Um, like instead of using words to describe uh, how, you know, how does it work when in this situation or that situation, be able to describe it in sort of, let's call it code, mm. right? Declarative code is, um, is much more precise and terse. And so yeah. it was actually really easy for the whole work group to kind of get on board with, and we could move on to like figuring out how this whole Swagger 2.0 thing should work uh, and not think about so much the format because that just followed along sort of organically through the JSON schema. And so that was fantastic. And, and you know, they continue with the JSON schema. And they, I think they finally got rid of the hyper schema and they just go straight to the uh, regular schema format now, which is fantastic. Uh, but that was after I got in. Um, mm -hmm. That was after the 2.0 release. Uh, Brady Gaster, I think, never got, uh, never got credited on the Swagger 2.0 specification. Uh, I think I was the only one that did. Uh, but he was definitely also um, instrumental in getting JSON schema into Swagger. Mm -hmm. and, and seeing that. So I think, yeah, open API today might not have been on JSON schema at all if, if we hadn't helped out there on the early days as well. So mm -hmm. I feel like that, that, was, that was a big win for JSON schema. It turned out to be. I didn't know that till maybe like a couple of years ago. Um, just yeah. because open API won right there everywhere now. So yeah, I mean, JSON schema has been uh, a very popular thing in, in the open API space um, yeah. and people have often not even realized there's a separate specification and yeah we've, we've done a lot of work over the last couple of years to uh, rein in that diversion um, mm -hmm. because there was a really disparity between the, the version that open API uh, even up to three uses um, versus what JSON schema defines and once we picked up JSON schema and ran with that a bit more there was more and more versions and there was a big divergence then 
Um, so we've now sort of come back and uh, full circle and it's open API 3.1 is, is using JSON schema fully or supports oh. JSON schema fully, um, the latest version as well. Okay. Yeah, so, that's very cool. I saw some blog posts recently about like how there were some issues with how the JSON schema didn't quite fit. But then when the new version of uh, JSON mm. schema came out, it was like, okay, now finally it all falls into place and all the pieces of the puzzles mm. uh, land where they should and all that stuff. Yeah, Phil Sturgeon has been instrumental in getting the word out on that and just explaining it to people, but also a lot of the actual work as well. Um, okay. So yeah, Phil Sturgeon is definitely a huge help on, on that work. That's fantastic. The, the only, the only um, thing about that is that the nature of an open API is such that you know they're they're um, they're never they're never a document you open in like let's say an editor. So the schema, like all the different editors, cannot provide just because of the nature of it. Like you don't open uh, that JSON file that describes your like your open API JSON file. You you navigate to it in the browser to see what it is and you know test the APIs. Uh, but that means that the uh, the the IDEs out there don't actually use schema store to give intelligence and so on for the for the for the open api document just because of the nature of it and i feel like that's so sad because it's like one of the most per pervasive json schema things out there and um it's like the one thing that the editors in visual studio can actually <coughs> help you with from an from an editing perspective interesting no. well, hopefully we can um look to change that in the future <laughs> you know some people are you know a lot of people are wanting uh, easier ways to edit their open API specs and their, their JSON schema um, specs. I know that a lot of uh, the frameworks, like the web frameworks out there, they just produce them. Mm -hmm. They automatically produce the the open API spec documents, right? Like at mm -hmm. runtime. So I think, like, I think ASP.NET does that at least. I'm sure that mm -hmm. a bunch of others do the same. Hmm. It might be like you install a package that does it or something, but um, mm -hmm. um, do people manually edit their uh, open API spec? Um, I, I, I believe so. Um, I, oh. I, I manually write JSON schemas quite a lot. Um, but yeah, we get quite a lot of people that are manually writing their open API specifications, um, well, even coming into the then. JSON schema forum. Okay. Well, I take everything I just said back. <laughs> I, I thought it was always auto-generated. Okay. Um, yeah, I think yeah, a lot of people also generate, but particularly when you consider the, um, you know, API design first, um, approach to, to doing APIs. Uh, when you have that collaborative design, as you say, you know, defining something in, in words, you have ambiguities, you have problems. And yeah. I've run into those sort of multiple times, which is how I ended up working with Jason Schema in the first place, trying to find mm -hmm. something that nailed down those, those exact uh, things that you wanted to describe, um, the structure that you wanted to define uh, without using words. Um, uh, when I was uh, working on a collaborative project um, in Miami a number of years ago, 2015-16, um, it took me sort of half a day to realize that when I was saying API, other people in the room were understanding it to mean something completely different. Uh, it took me half a day just to, just to know that people were saying words to mean different things. Uh, so when we got to the nuts and bolts of it, the technical structure definitions, being able to use JSON schema to define those versus just words made a huge difference in in the progress we could make because we could collaboratively design the document uh, specifically yeah. structured um, rather than relying on interpretation. Yeah, like it creates like a, a common language, right, between people. Yeah, exactly. Um, and you know, this is one of the things people use Postman for a lot is is defining their. API specifications collaboratively before it even hits the code. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of what people are, are doing now that I'm seeing is, is generating code from their schemas. That, you know, they're creating their schemas, uh, their schema definitions, their JSON schemas, and their open API files first and generating the code, their servers from that. Um, so um, you know, we're seeing people work in, in both directions, and I guess it depends what you're most familiar and comfortable mm -hmm. with, what space you work in. People are either you know, generating their the open API documents from code or generating the code from open API documents. Um, wow. So we're, we're seeing both directions here. That's really interesting, right? So, um, and so tools like Postman and other sort of things that can send requests and all that sort of stuff, 
that's all becomes almost your unit test, right? So as you start, like you can do TDD almost with it. So as you start implementing those different um, endpoints or whatever, you can then things start getting green. Yeah, exactly. So um, that's fantastic. I think, I think we're going to see a lot more uh, generating from schemas moving forward. Uh, yeah. we, we have form generation and we're working with a few uh, database vendors to do database uh, level generation and uh, validation at the database layer with JSON schema. Mm -hmm. Well, you can also go the other way. And, um, we had an early prototype um, that we actually released for Visual Studio 2013, like an extension that would take any JSON file and produce the schema mm -hmm. file based on that, which people have been asking for ever since. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, there's a number of uh, implementations that do similar things. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, the most popular still creates a, a problem when it generates for most people. We see a problem a lot when it's using uh, the items keyword um, in uh, tuple format rather than uh, single single item format. Uh, we, okay. we split those keywords into two keywords, the latest version, to avoid that that situation. Yeah, yeah, that's common common stumbling block that one. But I, that's that's um, I think like a big deal for a lot of um, like if you have your config file and you have a NuGet package or a, a npm package or whatever. Um, you want a schema and if you've never done it before, if you can just right click and say generate schema, you know, that uh, at least the first version of it, or, you know, or it's like with translations, right? Mm -hmm. um, get the machine to translate first and then just um, like yeah. to a different language. And then it's easy to kind of just modify and, and make yeah. small changes we, here and there. We're, we're trying to, when we remember to use the term scaffolding a schema rather than generating a schema, you know, back yeah. when you, like, you scaffold projects or whatever, right. it's, it's. Uh, yeah, you create sort of the initial, that's an initial creation, but it's intended for you to modify. Yeah, exactly. So that's the semantic yeah. difference. Yeah. yeah. And we're trying to make other tooling to make uh, the generation process easier as well. Mm -hmm. That's very cool. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, man. So that's been really interesting. And I think um, a lot of people are going to get so much from that. Yeah, my pleasure. I'd, I'm always happy to, to talk about Jason Schema and I very rarely get the chance to. So thank you for having me on. Great. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your day. You too. Thanks.